had a pleasant Thanksgiving week with your family. Hope you bit your tongue more than once. <laughs> you know, uh, when we first, my wife, my family and I, when we first moved here, you know, for several years, every time I saw Jim Dowdney, he would say, Roll Tide. Every time. I don't know if he was just trying to get a rise out of me or stir me up, you know. I mean, I would be walking across a parking lot, and he would be nowhere around, and I would hear, Roll Tide, in a very, like, country accent, like, right? And I would just shake my head. See, you can razz me about the Saints, and I'm like, yeah, I can take it or leave it. But when it comes to college football, it's a different story. I've always been a bigger college fan. And Jim Downey would try to stir me up because Alabama was really good. Past tense. <laughs> of course, that was all in good fun. But have you ever, have you ever had somebody come up to you, right, and make this off the wall uh, uh, phrase or, 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 or say something that was just really out of place just to try and stir you up and get something out of you? Because they knew that they were hitting, hitting a, a trigger point for you, right? Has somebody ever just come up to you and, and asked a question or begin to try to have a discussion about something that they knew was a hot topic for you, and all they were really trying to do was get you riled up, stirred up, right? Maybe it was about politics, or maybe it was about sports, right? Or maybe it was about Jerry Jones and the Cowboys. I mean, that's, I'm not from Texas, but there's like this love-hate, or maybe it's just a hate relationship with Jerry Jones that, that Texans have with him. Uh, maybe, maybe it was about just, just some political thing that's happened, maybe some theological point, something. Have you ever had somebody, or maybe you were that person, who would try and just stir people up, stir the pot up, right, by asking certain things or bringing up certain topics? Have you ever had that happen to you? I'll tell you, I've had that happen to me, and I can't stand it, okay? Jesus seems to have dealt with a lot of circumstances where people had things that they wanted to say, things that they brought up, just to see what they could get out of it just to see how he would respond, just to see what he would do. In Matthew 22, you have such an occasion. Matthew 22 and verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. And this is what he said. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? In the law. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And then he says, A second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says something very interesting that you really need to keep in mind here. Because, you know, this. This, uh, this Pharisee could have been thinking about all sorts of different things that Jesus could say. He could expect lots of different responses. Maybe it was one of these questions where let's just see what he is going to focus on. Let's just see what this guy is really about. And in doing so, maybe now we have something that we can use just to kind of poke, just to stir him up and see. And then Jesus says this. And this kind of throws it all up on its head. On these two commandments depend. Your translation might say hang. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, the law and the prophets were expressions of this very thing. Love. Think about that. You can go and you can read the law. And you can have questions about the law. You can question, what does this mean? Or, or how does this apply? Or what does this look like? Or why is this stated here? And you can go and look at what all the prophets had to say. And you can scratch your heads wondering, what's going on here? What am I supposed to take away from this? What did they mean by this? And regardless of what conclusions you come to, regardless of what you believe about what's being said there, all of those things are nothing more than expressions or demonstrations of the greatest command to love God and to love others. 
In other words, these are expressions and demonstrations of the very thing. And so you know what that means? That means every time you read the Bible, every time you study it, every time you try to interpret it or maybe teach it, whenever you come to conclusions about what you see in this book, you look at it, you pass it through the lens and the filter of love. Because it's nothing more than expressions of the greatest command. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. And so, therefore, the conclusions you come to, the things that you learn, the information that you gather, if that is ever going to pass over, come over to your every day, if it's ever going to make an impact on your day to day, if it's ever going to go beyond just the sphere of philosophical concepts, if it's going to become practical and a reality, you must ask yourself then this question, what does love require of me? What then does love require? Of me. There are two types of people, two categories, if you will, of people who have influenced your life more than anybody else. There are two categories of people that have more to do with who you are right now than anything else. Those who have hurt you deeply and those who have loved you profoundly. Two types of people, two categories of people with greater influence on in your life and have more to do with, the, with who you are than anything else. Those who have loved you profoundly and those who have hurt you deeply. In fact, good practice in counseling always takes you back to these two things. Why? Because those who have loved you profoundly and hurt you deeply have more to do with who you are than anything else. In other words, the way you have been treated by others has lots, if not most, to do with who you are today than anything else. So that also means how you treat others potentially has more to do with who they are than anything else. How you parent, how you spouse, if you will, how you friend, how you do you has much to do with the doses that you've received of these two things. Those who have hurt you deeply and those who have loved you profoundly. And Jesus knew this. And Jesus said this in John 15, 12. This is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Because you and I have the potential to love others deeply or to hurt others deeply. You and I have the potential to influence other people for the better or for the worse. To think about the reality that there are people walking around in this world and they're walking around, and who they are has a lot to do with how you may have influenced them for the better or for the worse. Think about that. Think about this. And what that means. And the implication of this. That I could have such interactions with people and have such power and influence on them and their lives and who they are. And it could be something that's incredible that helps them to have an amazing outlook on life and to know and feel and experience what love is. And 
yet there's also those who have been maybe been deeply hurt by things that you and I have said, have done, how we've treated them. And that still hangs on. There are two categories of people who have more to do with who we are today than anything else. Those who have deeply hurt you and those who have profoundly loved you. Think about that. That's a lesson we need to be teaching our children. That's a lesson that our teens, your teens, your kids are experiencing now. And that is something that you yourself have experienced in your life. We need to understand what love requires of us because of the impact that we can have on other people. It's something way beyond, I think, most times that we even comprehend. Think about it in your own life. Think of people, situations where you have been deeply hurt. Now think of situations or people who have profoundly loved you and the impact that that has had on how do we have the same impact on other people for the better and not the worse? If we're going to do this, the lesson is very simple. Also, yet yeah, because we're humans, quite complicated. We have to ask the question, what does love require of me in this situation? See, when we ask that question, it has the power to help us connect with other people's stories. Because everybody has a story. Think about that. The people with whom Jesus had contact with, they all had stories. And Jesus, think about this, knew their stories. And he loved them anyway. In fact, when you look at what Jesus did... He always did what love required. In fact, check this out. Look at this. Think about these things. Jesus knew Matthew's story and called him anyway. Jesus knew what he was getting into when he called James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who wanted to call out fire from heaven to destroy a Samaritan village. Yeah, Jesus knew that. He knew how they were. That's why they got the nickname. And he called them anyway. Jesus knew the woman who was washing his feet, how she was looked upon, how she was used, the fact that she was a woman of the city, a prostitute, and he let her wash his feet anyway. Jesus knew that he, when he healed the ten lepers, that only one would be grateful. And he did it anyway. See, Jesus knew the stories of all the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the sinners. He even knew the stories of the Pharisees. And yet, he ate with them, he gathered with them, he called them any way. And when you look at what he did and how he responded, he always did what love required. And what you see, Jesus do over and over again. Is love profoundly. Look, I like to talk about and discuss what Jesus meant by what he said. I like doing that a lot. I like to talk about a lot of things. I like to philosophize, if you will. It's not a word, I just made it. About what all this means and why were these things said. I like to talk about a lot of things, but I think we have the tendency to talk more about what Jesus might have meant by what he said than actually doing something with what he said. And I think the thing that will help us go from just talking about what he meant by what he said is asking this question, what does love 
require of me? What does love require of me? So, what does love require of me? I tell you, love requires of us to love profoundly. But how do I love profoundly? By asking the question, what does love require of me? In every situation, with every circumstance and person, every difficult, tense moment, every trial and tribulation, every problem, every high, every low, we ask, what does love require of me? And when we answer that question based on our conclusions we gather, our interpretations we understand from Scripture, the end result will eventually lead us to loving profoundly. So, ask yourself this question. What does love require of me? It's a simple message. Oh, but it's such a difficult thing to answer. It's such a difficult thing to stop and to contemplate how love should be the driving force to how I respond in this situation. But I tell you, you get into the practice of asking the question, you do less knee-jerk reactions and more responses. And the more we do this, I'm convinced we will actually love like Jesus. So what does love require of you? Let's pray. God, we are entering into a season. A season that is difficult for some, that is filled with joy and anticipation for others. We are entering a season that can be very intense. We're entering a time, a time where our focus and our attention can be drawn in so many different ways. I pray, Father, that as we walk through this time of year, that as the opportunities arise, we ask the question, what does love require of me? And I pray that you would show us in these moments how to love profoundly. Teach us how to love. And may we come out at the end of this season refreshed, renewed, with a new perspective and what love requires of us. In Jesus' we so the message is quite simple. What does love require of me? And it might sound like it's a little weak. You might feel like you just drank a little milk. Because there's not a whole lot to chew on. It's deceptive because when you sit down and think and you ponder how do I handle this situation from the perspective of love, that's where the deep This is Christmas season, right? Typically, during December, 
the last, the last couple of years, I like to do series that are based around the concept of Advent. We typically do something that reminds us of the anticipation that we should be living in the reality that Jesus will be returning, that the reality that there's hope for the future, that there's, there's so much unknown and so much to explore here, but yet there's so much, right, to anticipate as we go through this season. And it reminds us of the anticipation that the Jews had of the Messiah and who that would be. Uh, this year, we're doing things just a little bit different. Um, I really didn't want to focus on Advent. I really didn't want to uh, develop a series around it. It just didn't come together. You know those things where you're trying to do something and it just, it just doesn't work, and so you go on to something else, and then you realize, well, this is the thing we should be doing. That's what happened. And so the series that we've developed uh, for December is really centered around the message of, Christ, uh, of Christmas. And I know there's lots of different takes, lots of different nuggets, lots of different approaches to this stuff. But here's the approach that I'm taking. The message of Christmas is this very thing, love. And it's a love that is so profound that it's hard and nearly, I would think, impossible for us to wrap our minds around it. We get glimpses. We get expressions or demonstrations, and we see things that would only make sense because of a profound love. And so our series this month is all about this, asking the question, what does love require of me? I believe that that's a part of the Christmas message because the Christmas message is this right here is love. Philippians 2, have this mind in you as it was in Christ who became himself a servant, came in the likeness of man, of us, flesh and bone. In other words, he was born. That's the Christmas story, right? But what's the message? What do we get from this? And the spin that we want to take on is asking this question. What does love require of me? That being said, every Sunday I'm going to send out uh, to you a uh, kind of a, a devotional, kind of similar to what we did with Advent and what we did during the uh, Easter, I think it was Lent season, uh, where it gives you a little bit of things to chew on based on the message. There's some reflections and there's some, some things to focus on. Uh, through meditations. I will begin to send that out today and every Sunday hereafter uh, during this series, you will receive something to help walk you through to keep your mind focused on this very concept of what love requires of you throughout the week. Next week, we will continue this series and we're going to talk about the tension, the tension that we'll feel, the tension that we need to sit in when it comes to asking this question. What does love require of me? Because sometimes the answer is not the answer we want. Sometimes the answer will make us so uncomfortable and make us want to run away. Sometimes the answer is hard. And it goes against everything, everything that we hold to be true. Mm -hmm.